And then today we've got Corey from Codapaxi with us, product developer. Yes. And so she'll talk again a little bit more about product development and what she kind of does there at Codapaxi. Cool. Awesome. Oh my gosh, you guys, thank you so much for having me. Um, really nervous because this is like, this feels like super intense and like amazing up here. Um, oh, I need to turn my mic on, so that's great. I'm already messing up. Okay, I think it's on. Awesome. So, um, like your teacher said, so I'm Corey. I am from Cotopaxi. I do product <laughs> development. I'm a senior product developer right now, and I think, uh, I don't want to tell you how long I've been out of college, but it's been a long time. So um, I think I'll just like start in with a little bit about who I am and my education and where I got to, and then I'll talk to you a little bit about like what I do day to day, which is different every single day. So that's exciting. Um, anyways, I figured why not break the ice and just share this really amazing picture of me as a seven-year-old in 4-H. Ironing fabric to make a pillow. This is me. I'm very serious about everything when I'm working, so I should have probably known I was going to be a product developer. Um, anyways, I grew up all over Oregon. Go Ducks! Um, sorry. <laughs> um, Washington and New Hampshire. Um, I grew up with two parents who worked in the forest service, so I basically just like lived in the middle of nowhere and all these different outside these national forests. Um, so I grew up loving the outdoors, but I also grew up um, being super dorky and crafting and sewing and all sorts of stuff. So um, it sort of made me who I was and got me to where I am right now. Um, I spent my time camping, crafting, getting lost in the woods. Um, Honestly, I think it's super rad that you guys have this program because I didn't have something so, um, like I had just like the ability to go to the Art Institute for apparel design, which is super great, but I love that you guys have it so drilled in and you can pick either design or development and you can really focus on your passion, which I hope the reason you guys are all here is because you like the outdoors, which is super awesome. Um, so like I said, I got my degree in apparel design at the Art Institute in Portland. So. I lived in Portland for like the past 15 years of my life and um, decided to make a crazy adventure and move to Utah about a year and three months ago and so far I really love it. Um, so I d this is, this is going to make sense in a minute. Um, when I was in school and one of the reasons why I wanted to come here and talk to you guys is because one of the most lasting impressions that I had when I was in school was when the product development director at Nike for Nike Basketball came in and talked to my class. And I think before that, I didn't even realize that there were other people that helped in anything because I was just going for design. And I honestly was just like, oh yeah, like I'm just going to be a designer and that's all there is. Like That's how you get product made. And I had no clue. And I think I had been in school for like three years at that point. So I was pretty much close to my senior year and starting my senior, um, my senior project and I still kind of like didn't even know how product got made. <laughs> so I'm super honored to be here and talk to you guys about it. Um, something that lasted with me was something that she said. Like she talked about her day to day but the thing that stuck with me to this day is how she described what a product developer's role is in the um, product creation uh, timeline. Um, so that's where this comes from. So um, she used this analogy um, that being a product developer is uh, like a wagon wheel. <laughs> so stay with me. So she said um, like all of the spokes inside the wheel are like design, merchandising, the factory, and then the middle part is the product that we're all trying to create. And the thing going around like the wheel holding it all together is a product developer. And yeah, that's totally cheesy, but you guys are gonna get to know me because I'm really cheesy. Um, and I love what I do, and I think that that's super true. You're the person that really holds it all together. Um, as a product developer, you're responsible for seeing and believing in the designer's vision, which is really, really important to me. Um, you have to have that connection to your designer and really believe in what they bring to the table and want to make it succeed in any way possible. Um, you're also responsible for communicating that, like that vision and problem solving it with the factory, which is another part that I love in my job. All the while keeping everything on track, um, making sure it costs in, making sure it's of the most quality and um, that it fits and it gets there on time. Because without all of those things, your company isn't going to make any money and otherwise your customer is going to think your product isn't very good. So being a product developer, you have to think about every single one of those things along the way 
and um, really have like an awesome connection to the rest of your team. And I personally love that. Um, one of my friends that I worked with at Pendleton, <laughs> she actually puts on her resume now, professional problem solver. And I really like that because that's essentially what you do every day. And I think that you could say, even if you were in design or merchandising, you're going to do a little bit of that as well. But as a developer, you're getting hit with problems every single day from every single, like all these different seasons and all these different um, problems to solve. And you have to be able to keep the dream alive and try to find a solution because nobody wants to work with cranky pants. So um, a little bit. Also, I wanted to tell you guys, if you have questions, totally ask me along the way. Um, I don't know if it's early for you guys, but it's early for me. Like I'm usually just driving to work right now. So um, please ask questions so that we can have more of a conversation along the way. And just like raise your hand or shout it out. Um, do you guys have any questions so far? Cool. <laughs> um, awesome. So a little bit about where I went after college. So like I said, I got my bachelor's of science in apparel design. And um, I worked at this tiny little hole in the wall hand loom knit company in Portland during college, as well as I interned for her. Um, it was called Suchi. And I don't have a picture of it because it was so long ago. But um, essentially, I did everything from linking the sweaters. Like, if you guys have actually seen how industrial sweaters are made, like, I was sitting on a linking machine for like eight hours of a day. This is like what you do when you do it. <laughs> and I was just like linking these sweaters and learning what it meant to actually like make product on a timeline. Um, and I'm not gonna say like factory workers because I've seen factory workers and it wasn't the same, but definitely gave me like an understanding for the product creation on the other side um, that we don't think about a lot. Um, while I was there, uh, yeah, like I said, I got to link sweaters. Um, I even like ironed and packed them and would race to get to them to UPS every day. I went to trade shows with the owner. Um, I did a lot of customer service, a lot of like really fun phone calls with people. <laughs> and um, I even did like her workbook creation and some of the more like design side. Um, it was really cool. I learned a lot and um, I wouldn't trade that experience for the world. Although during that, it was like during college and a little bit after college and I was like, oh my God, like what am I gonna do with my career? I can't just stay here. But um, like for everything that I learned from that, that job got me to where I am now. And it got me to my next step, which is Pendleton. Um, I worked at Pendleton for two years after I worked at Suji. And it's where I truly became a product developer. So I got a job there being a knitwear product developer. So um, another like super fun nerdy thing about me is I love sweaters and I love knitting. So um, if anyone else does, you're awesome. Um, and so I got to work as a true product developer at Pendleton for their fully fashion knits and their cut and sew knits. Um, I worked on a super fun collection called the Portland Collection as well as some of their like some of their other stuff. But um, while I was there, I really, I really learned what it meant to be a product developer and work with a design team and a merchandiser. And it's funny because like when I look back on that experience, there was still so much I didn't even understand about product creation. But we got it done. Do you guys have questions yet? Cool. <laughs> so. Um, after Pendleton, the reason I left Pendleton is honestly like super simple. I needed to make more money um, because I had student loans. So I put myself through college and it was awesome and I wouldn't trade that for anything either. But obviously, as you guys will know soon, um, you also have to make money. So Pendleton wasn't quite cutting it. And um, I needed, to, I, I got this awesome opportunity actually because of somebody I worked with at Pendleton. They recommended me to a recruiter at Adidas and Adidas reached out and I had already been trying to like look, I don't know if you guys know, but Portland is like a hub for sportswear. So I was like looking at Columbia Sportswear and Nike and I wasn't trying super hard, but it was definitely like getting my feelers out there. And I got re recruited for um, by a recruiter at Adidas because of somebody I worked with at Pendleton, which is super great. Um, and I started my career at Adidas, which was five and a half years. Um, this is honestly where I finally learned <laughs> about the product calendar and the timeline that you have to work on, the process, like it actually matters if garments cost in, it does. 
Um, and I really got to know just like how to work in a cross-functional team, which is personally one of my favorite things about my job. Um, when I first started at Adidas, I worked on women's training. And whenever I say that, people think I was training people, but it's actually just like workout wear. So it was really cool. And from that, I got, um, I don't know if you can tell, but I'm really enthusiastic. So people uh, always ask me to do a lot of things. And I got asked to work on a special project called Audi Girl, which was really cool. And we did this, um, we essentially, so normal product developer holds about like uh, 50 to 60 styles a season at Adidas. And, um, which is like not too many actually, surprisingly. Um, but they asked if I wanted to work on this Audi Girl collection as well as do my normal job. And it was pretty new. So I was like, yes, I totally want to. And um, it was crazy. I worked a lot on it and it was like a hundred extra styles on top of my other workload. But the coolest part about it is that at, at that time, this was like six years ago, Adidas wasn't like super cool. <laughs> And um, they really needed to hit the market with like, some younger, fresh things. So I worked with um, just like a select few designers on it. And we brought, to, brought it to market in six months, which is sort of crazy because 40 styles in six months, usually you do like 18 months. So it was really cool. And honestly, the only reason it worked is because I was really energetic about it. But also I had like an awesome team to work with and a factory that I would call almost every night. So that was really cool. Um, and from there, I went on, I was still at Adidas, I did NCAA basketball uniforms, which was a total trip, but really fun. Um, there's a lot more involved in that than you would think, because every single number is like a different trim, and it has a different item number, and they're actually more complicated than you would think, and you make terrible money on them. Um, and uh, from there, I got to work on inline basketball. So I got to work on Damian Lillard's um, <laughs> product uh, that we do for him, his apparel, and then uh, Derek Rose, and sometimes I forget, uh, James Harden, so that was really cool. Um, and from there, I got this like crazy call one day, and there I was just like sitting at my desk working on basketball stuff, and this, this lady was like, hey, so we're going to do a collab with Kanye, and we're doing the shoes, and it's really exciting, but we're going to pay me do apparel. <coughs> And I was like, yeah, that's cool. I don't really like him. Um, and <laughs> she was like, yeah, but like everything that you did on Audi Girl is kind of like what we want to do for the Kanye apparel. We want to be able to do quick turn product. We want to be able to like get it done fast. We want to be able to do it like on a timeline, but in process, but not necessarily to Adidas um, process standards. Because if if there's anything I could tell you about Adidas, it's that they love process and almost like too much. So like, there's like tons of process and tons of rules so they wanted to kind of like break those barriers to be able to do something really cool um and i actually said no i was like no thanks like i'm cool like that doesn't really align with who i am like that's that's awesome um and then i went to germany to do a presentation which i'm so good at um and i had to do a presentation on basketball product development and i was doing this presentation and the crazy thing is remember the lady that I told you about they worked at Nike who told me that product development is like a wagon wheel she was sitting in the audience because they had just hired her for the product development director for Yeezy and she came up to me afterwards and she was like please apply to this job and I was like oh god I was like dying because I had like I was like in front of like 500 people with like an actual microphone and I was like gonna faint um and she just told me like that she wanted to do something really special and you know like that she thought it would be really fun to work together and of course it was like really hard to say no to somebody that I had like looked up to and the reason why I was a product developer. So long story short, um, I worked on Kanye's apparel for a while. I don't tell everybody that because it's like ugh, it's kind of a weird thing, but um, <laughs> it was a super crazy experience. It was. Um, a year and a half of my life at Adidas and I learned more about how you could create product and how you shouldn't create product than I could have ever possibly imagined. Um, I got to meet Kanye like a few times. That was interesting. Um, but it, it was like, it was really hard because we wanted to make something so amazing for him. Um, but he changes his mind all the time. And um, 
So it was really hard for a developer because you're constantly having to be like, cool, guess what? Like, I just got you this sample in two weeks. And usually it takes two months and he'd be like, cool, I don't like it. And I want to do something else now. And you'd have to be like, okay, cool. Tell me what you want to do. And you had at the same time, like maintaining a relationship with the factory that we were working with so that they didn't totally hate us because that's also really hard on a factory. Um, during that job, I actually learned how to build calendars for a product, which is really cool and sounds dorky, but it's actually one of the things I love now because without an actual timeline, um, you don't actually know if something is achievable. So you're just like working towards something and maybe you can't actually like meet the end goal. And I think like if you're all working towards like a common end goal, then you can make things happen. So it used to really scare me to make timelines as a product developer because then everybody relies on you. And then if one thing goes wrong, they're like, yeah, but you said, like you said that this is gonna work and like, this is the timeline. So it was a lot of pressure, but I learned how to roll with it um, and that was, honestly super fun um anyways through my experience at um on yeezy i realized that i love still being like super scrappy as a developer and i love small teams but um i like the outdoors <laughs> and i really wanted to do something and find something within my career that aligned more with my values um how i grew up like being in the forest and hiking and camping and um, I also had been in Portland for like 15 years and I needed to get out. So I started looking at companies all over the US that were outdoors. And then I was like, that's not enough for me because of what I felt. I didn't wanna just like make a bunch of stuff to waste things anymore. And everything that I had done, like for example, when I was on Yeezy, we, we probably brought to life like 250 to 300 apparel samples. And I don't know if you guys like follow that apparel at all we actually brought to market um two products so they were actually one pair of pants in like two different drops so it was really hard because you just constantly got like great good job no i'm good i don't want to do that or yeah i'm totally going to approve that and then like a month later it was like yeah i don't know like i'm kind of into the outdoors now and you're just like all right cool um so i just didn't really want to like waste a bunch of people's time at the factory, waste fabric and all of that anymore. And I wanted to find something that meant more. So through all of my research, I found Cotopaxi um, and I decided that I was going to work there. And I didn't really know how, but I actually just got on LinkedIn and um, I found, I don't know if any of you were in Ali's talk or knew Ali Salter, but Ali Salter was the uh, product development director at Cotopaxi, and she's gone now, so I'm a team of one. But um, she, I reached out to her on LinkedIn when I was still on Yeezy, and I, would, I just told her about who I was and that I really wanted to work for Cotopaxi, and she wrote me back. I remember sitting in Kanye's office, and I got her email, and I was like, I was just like, oh my God, this is so awesome. And then at the end of it, it was like, we don't have any job openings right now, but keep looking. And it was like really disheartening, but also I felt really um, positive about it as well because I figured, well, at least she wrote me back, right? <laughs> so I just continued to stalk her. Um, and that was like in January, almost, oh my gosh, almost two years ago. And in May or June of that year, they had a product developer role open and I emailed her again and I was like, hey, so I see it is for a junior level product developer. I'm still super interested. Is there any like lean is there any like lenience in um, the job title or is there any way like are you guys like looking just for like a lower level or could you maybe have like a higher level? And all she said was why don't you apply and we can talk. <laughs> so um, anyways, long story short, I applied. I had, um, I think like five phone interviews, which was a lot. Um, some video ones, which was with Ben, actually, if you guys know Ben Doxy. Um, Ben's my man, I love Ben. Um, had some interviews with him and then finally got like flown in for an interview and did like an epic all day <laughs> interview with like everybody from like CEO level to executive to just like people that I'd work with day to day. And by the end of the day, like I had never, by the way, been to Utah. Um, Utah is really awesome. If you guys are from here, it's really cool. Um, and by the end of the day, I was just like, oh my God, I really want to work here. I hope that they pick me. 
I was also really exhausted. Um, and I remember I was, like, walking to go um, – I was walking to, like, Fisher Brewery because I was just, like, super tired. And I was like, well, I'm proud of myself. And Allie called me and was told me, like, that she would offer me the job. And it was, like, the coolest moment of my career and also the scariest moment of my career because I kind of, like, gave up – I say gave up, but, like, I decided to leave Adidas with this, like, really great career for something that a lot of people would be like, what are you doing? And a lot of people said that to me. And – um, I can honestly tell you that it's been like the most amazing experience of my life this last like year and a half. So I'm super glad that I did it. And also I love that I came to Utah. Um, that's like a little bit about who I am and how I got here. I can talk about next like more day to day what I do. Do you guys have any questions? Yes, a question. How is the transition between like job to job? Like is there a lot of differences that yeah. you don't know going into it? Do you mean, like, within Adidas or just, like, in general? Just, like, like how the system works between, like, uh, Pendleton and Adidas. Totally. And it's so different. <laughs> Every single experience was so different. So, for example, when I was at Pendleton, we were still working in spreadsheets. So, like, all of our um, product work was done in spreadsheets. Um, tech packs, obviously, were done in Illustrator. And that thing seems to be the thing that always is the same throughout each company. But whatever system developers work on, for some reason, just seems to be different. Um, and then when I went to Adidas, we worked on a PLM system. And I, like I said, everything was so process oriented. Like it was like they had like a book of um, abbreviations for different words that they had that you had to like use. It was crazy, um, but really cool. Uh, and we had probably like five or six different calendars. And when I worked within like each different team at Adidas, it was totally different as well. So just being able to be like roll with the punches and try to get in there and not know, not feel like you know everything right away and listen to how they do it really helped me. And I think because I've moved around to different teams and different jobs, when I came to Cotopaxi, um, it, wasn't, it wasn't super scary. It was actually fun because I took the crazy part and slash fun part of Yeezy and I brought it with me to Cotopaxi and everybody was just like so much more willing to try different things. So um, yeah, when I first came to Cotopaxi, we weren't getting cost sheets, which is really important because again, like if you want your company to like have a life, you, you probably have to have your product cost in. So I got to implement like a whole new costing process, which is a fun part of product development, but don't be scared because it's not like crazy math because I'm not very good at math. But um, And I also got to build their product calendars, which I had never done before except for like on a smaller basis on Yeezy. So it was really cool. That was a really long answer. <laughs> Do you guys have any other questions? What is the, what is the product calendar? Totally. I'm so glad you asked. Hello. <laughs> so, um... This is like this is a good question. So this is just a snapshot of our S21 calendar that um, I was helped build um, at Cotopaxi. But the product calendar is essentially um, your timeline and milestones for how you're going to start a season and end it with production in a warehouse. So without it, you're basically just sort of like just taking like shots in the dark. And you're like, cool, I hope this works out. I hope that gets done in time. Um, and it, it's really hard, I think, to build a business without it and to have clients and actually build product that, that works and then actually make decisions. Because, I mean, I have a design degree, so I know how hard it is to finally just be like, cool, I'm going to be done with that piece and we're going to call it good. So this allows you to know exactly how much time you have to build a product and like, make it come to life. Um, and it starts all the way from product create, like, uh, sorry, seasonal kickoff, where our merchandisers and designs will do like this awesome concept um, and tell you what the season's kind of going to, the feel is going to be like. And then merchandisers will be like, cool, I want like five tops and five bottoms, and this is the price point. And then from there, you go into like design review, and then you go into, um, tech packing and then you go into tech pack handover to development and then sometimes in there development does predictive costing which is another thing I like to do um, and then you go into like handing that off to the factories and then you go into your like your proto rounds and without this you don't know how many proto rounds you can actually have so it's actually kind of tricky because 
every single tiny piece within your garment has a certain amount of time it takes to be made. So for example, what's your name? Rhett. Rhett, I like your Tekka. Thank you for wearing it today. Um, so for example, his Tekka, it has like the zipper probably takes like 30 to 40 days to produce. The fabric is remnant, so it's just there, which is amazing. Um, and then it probably takes like 60 days for them to make that production. So if I know that's how long that takes, so that takes what, like um, around like, uh, I don't know, 90 days for total garment production. If I know that and I can get that from the very end of this, like the cycle, then I can build an entire product creation timeline and build all of it then to the beginning and know when I have to start. Does that make sense? And then you have to factor in like C ship, which takes eight <laughs> weeks. Things take so long, you guys. You would have no idea. You're probably like, how are you guys building things on an 18 month calendar? And that's sometimes hard. Yes. When you're talking about proto rounds, is that like prototyping? Yeah, so protos, um, and it's fun, like every company, like to your question, calls it something different. Um, at Adidas, we called it CR1. It was creation uh, round one. <laughs> and um, I was like, wait, what does it mean? And then we call it just like proto round. Like everybody, call it, most people call it proto round. So it's the amount of times you're going to see a style before you approve it for production. Um, most 18 month calendars at most companies, you get to see it twice, which is you're going to probably be like, what? That's like, that's not very much. And, um, but it has to do with like how long it takes to make all the fabric and the trims and then the garment. Um, and then the amount of time that your team needs to then write comments and do all of these things. So, um, but for Cotopaxi, we found a way to build in three proto rounds. Um, and honestly, sometimes we do four. So it's really cool. You guys have any other questions? Yeah. Do you feel that earning your stripes at Adidas kind of helped you get a foot in the door with a smaller company like Cotopaxi? Or do you feel like a smaller company like Cotopaxi may be better for like an entry level position and then maybe bring mm -hmm. it to a larger company? That was a super good question. Also, I liked your pun. Um, <laughs> uh, I do think it helped me, um, but I don't think it's necessary to have worked for Adidas to work for Cotopaxi, if that makes sense. I think that, um, I think it helped me understand process and how to get things done and how to build things. And I think that's what helps me every day in my job right now, especially being a team of one in, in a team that still needs to grow and um, build processes and figure things out, is now I know how to take from what I did at um, Adidas from every single team I was there and take all that with me and be like, cool, how are we gonna like Cotopaxi this? So yes and no, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you feel like um, maybe so doing something at such a large scale as like doing, you know, like basketball product development, that condenses and synthesizes down the concepts you learned there will synthesize down better to Cotopaxi rather than trying to expand maybe what you learned in a smaller company into something large scale like maybe working at Adidas. Yes. So I but I think for me it was the fact that I came from small companies before Adidas. So I was able to get that like I still had like the scrappiness, I guess I would call it. Um, and like the roll up my sleeves <laughs> attitude of I want to get my fingers into everything. Um, as well as like the larger scale kind of things that I learned at Adidas. Um, I don't think that I would be as successful in my job right now um, if I hadn't had both of those experiences in my career. Yeah. Do you guys have any other questions? What's up? How much wiggle room would you say you give yourself for the product calendars? <laughs> That's a super good question. Um, we call it buffer. <laughs> I think some of us like to give us more ourselves more buffer than others, and it depends on what you actually do um, within the product team. So I admittedly probably sometimes don't give myself enough wiggle room because I'm like, it's cool, I got this, I can do this. Um, so for example, this is this is cool. I, this leads into my next thing I was gonna say anyways. For example, like right now, like for my for my day to day in the last from last week until next Friday, I have three major deadlines. Um, it's really exciting. Um, I had to uh, send color bombs, so bill of materials. I had to send color bill of materials for our S21 product um, for SMS, which is salesman samples. So I had to go through a like 
uh, I don't know, we call it a workbook, but essentially it's like an illustrator color sketch of every single garment we're doing in every single color down to the detail of what color is the lining going to be, what color is the zipper going to be, and build like a bill of materials out for what that looks like and send it to the factories along with our merchandise planner and he sends like the quantities and that's so that we can get SMS so that our salespeople can actually sell the product so that we can make money and then we know how much to order. So with that, I did that like last week. Um, and usually I give myself like two weeks to do it, but this last time we had a late handover from our design team, not to their fault, because, but because things happen. So we had a week to do it and we just um, posted up at home and made it happen. Um, and then as well, right now I'm working on, so this is a photo of a comment that I just sent the factory, I think two days ago. Um, so as a product developer, I'm also responsible for communicating like how we want to change product um, for the next proto round. So we received P2 for spring 21. Uh, my brain has like too many seasons in it right now, but like a month ago and we met about it and we decided, hey, like this is what we want to change for construction and design. And this is what we want to change for fit. And then all of that information I have to take and communicate it to the factory and remembering that English is not their first language. So a lot of times I do pictures like this um, and I essentially go through and talk about like construction, material trends, fit, and then remarks. Sometimes I have a really fun costing conversation with them. Um, and so I'm sending all of those by Monday and then turning around from that I have to then um, switch gears and work on fall 20 um, for next Friday because I have to finalize, I, I say I, we as a team have to finalize um, all of fall 20 so that we can order bulk production so bulk production comes in on time so as a developer and oftentimes as a designer and a merchandiser you're like working in like three to four seasons at one time and you could be working on those seasons all of those seasons in one day so you kind of have to be able to like prioritize what's the most important thing um, I do a lot of lists I'm a checklist person like I'll put like the smallest thing on my checklist so I can check it off um, does that kind of help yeah I didn't really answer that, but other people on our team like more buffer than me. Um, I think once I get another person, <laughs> it'll be a little less crazy. Do you guys have any other questions? Cool. I'll just keep going. Oh, yeah. Um, they were kind of doing um, however many it took to get it done, and then whenever it was done, that's when they would buy it. But what was happening is um, without the product calendar, they weren't actually bringing product to market when the sales team told all of our stores they would have it, which is a really tricky situation to get into. And then you lose, um, you kind of lose like your reputation a little bit and people don't trust you as much anymore. And so we had to really work on that and kind of, um, as Ali used to say, grow up a little bit because um, Without that, you're not really gonna have a business. You're not gonna stay around. So they, they would do sometimes three, sometimes two, sometimes four, sometimes six. Like it just really depends. And I have styles right now for fall 20 where we've seen four times and we still need another one. And that's nobody's fault. It just happens. You have to try to get like, um, just have to try to like think about how you can work creatively to figure, you know, keep it on track as much as possible. And then as soon as that like, that end date moves of when it's gonna be in the warehouse, which to me is like the drop dead date. Anything that happens that's gonna move that day out, then it's my job as a developer to tell everyone within my company that that could affect, which is my sales team, my marketing team, my merchandisers, my designers. And then we make a really hard decision and we're like, is it more important for the product to be on time or is it more important for the product to be right? And of course it should always be right, but maybe like that right is well, maybe like the zipper should be like a half a centimeter longer. So it's, it's hard. <laughs> yeah. How does your role change if like it's just like a new colorway for something you've already gone through the development, like mm -hmm. you kept the style, like the tickets? Yeah. Like how does that change? Because mm -hmm. I know you do different colorways and stuff. Yeah. Um, so technically we would call it a carryover. And with Tekka, it's different than a normal style. So like what I'm wearing would be a different process than what you're wearing. But um, for Tekka, essentially the factory, we have this really cool setup where, um, and I don't know how much you guys know about Tekka, but it's really cool and one of the reasons why I love working at Cotopaxi is that 
Um, I'm going to answer your question with this, I promise. Um, so with Tekka, essentially like in the product or in the product industry, tons of stuff goes to waste and you, you probably like already know that, but um, essentially like big giants like Patagonia even and um, Adidas will place like a, uh, an estimate on how much they think they're going to order for production. And then from that estimate, the factory will then order all of the material and trims ahead of time to, to get started so that they can meet the deadline because it takes so long to make everything. And oftentimes what happens is then the company actually gets all of their sales in and they don't have, like say they ordered like 100,000, but actually they only need 50,000. So then they just like have all of this excess material and trims. So that's where all of the stuff comes from, from your Tekka. And um, it's really cool because in normal companies, I say normal, but a lot of companies would um, either throw all of those materials and trims away after a year and a half or they burn them because they essentially like sit in a warehouse for a year and a half until they expire. They expire. I'm not really sure how, but they expire. Um, and then they get burned and thrown away. So what happens, and this is like coming back to your question, is our um, factory partners, they send our color designer basically like sheets of paper that have cuttings from all of the leftover materials that they have in every color. And then by that color, they say, we have like 500 yards of this one. We have 350 yards of this one. And essentially what the color designer does is they go through and they build the colorways off of that, working with development to figure out how many, how much they need of each piece. So like I work with them on the yield and then we work with them planning to tell them how much they can order of it. So it's already fit approved. So I don't have to go through the normal timeline, but it needs to be handed off like when I answered her question of when we do um, SMS bombs, because if I don't build it for SMS, then our sales force doesn't sell it, and then we don't make a lot of money on it. So that's how you have, like I've noticed there's like four different like color collections every yeah. year or something like yep. that. Yep. So how you crank them out. Yeah, every season that factory sends us sheets of paper of whatever they have left over and pretty soon we're gonna try to work with YKK to do the same same thing because right now the zippers aren't remnant. Um, it's really hard to find remnant zippers, but we're working on that too. So it'll just essentially she just picks and puts them all together. The bags that you guys have seen is they don't even send us what they have. They actually, we it's really cool. They It's the same sort of setup, but we've given the factory like free reign on creativity. Um, and they get to just like get all of their materials and they put the pattern pieces on and then the sewing line makes whatever they want, which is really fun. But also we found out um, when you give somebody free reign, sometimes they choose a really crazy camo print on your biggest new bag. And then you get it in and you're like, oh my God, I didn't even know that we needed to tell them not to use print. So as like, one of those things as a developer is you really have to think about what are all the end consequences and all the different ways that this thing could go. So you're almost like always like scanning the horizon for problems. And it can be kind of annoying for other people, so you have to find like a, a nice way to go about it. But, yeah. So I guess coming from a design program, was there a lot of adaptation when you first started to go into product development from like what you had learned in school? Um, or were there some skills and concepts that you could take from coming from a design program that you could apply and it wasn't really too much ad ad adaptation on your part? Um, so I would say for me, because mine was just apparel design, it was a little bit harder, but I still got a lot from the degree that I got. So I learned a lot about fit, which was super important, and construction. And I did have like one product development class where we tried to build a calendar, and I remember having like a heart attack because I was like, I can't do this. This is so hard. I don't even understand this. And now I'm doing it. Um, so I would say I brought like probably around 50% of what I learned in school. And then, oh, and actually like my Illustrator and Photoshop, I use a lot of Illustrator and Photoshop for um, uh, comments to the factory. So I'm gonna like raise that to maybe like 70%. And then the rest of the development side, I learned on the job. And I learned a lot of it from working at Suchi, like making sweaters every day. Yeah. Um, cool. I'm almost done, I promise. Um, so this is a picture of our uh, most recent design uh, development trip in China. And this is us with, so there's Ben and me, obviously, and then our design director, Evie. And then um, the other people are the people we work with at the factory. And 
one of the most important things to me, and if I could like just drill this home to you guys today, is the most important thing I think in um, the just product creation is the team, and I like to call it a triad. This is thanks Adidas. Um, <laughs> so I like to call it a true triad because without it, I don't think that you can be as successful. And when I say triad, I am counting development, design, and then merchandising, which is technically the factory I put kind of in development. So without an equal part on all of those, it can feel like I've had teams that feel um, basically really bad <laughs> and not great and I've had teams that feel amazing and the teams that feel amazing are when we each recognize that we each play an equal part in the role of bringing a product to life um, I don't own your design but I want to help make it come to life um, just as like design doesn't own my development process but they probably want to help me along the way and they have advice and things that we could do so we need to listen to one another and then the other thing that means a lot to me are my factories um, and the teams that we work with at our factories. So um, this is Snow here and with this chariot shirt. Her name is Snow and I email her like almost every day. And um, she is basically my counterpart, but on the factory side. So she communicates everything I communicate to her, to everyone that she works with to then make samples and then production. And without her, I would literally like go insane. Um, the other day she wrote me and said, thank you for your crazy work. And I think that she meant thank you for working crazy, like in a good way, but um, it was awesome. Um, so anyways, like being a part of a team and just bringing um, that, like lose your ego and like really like show up to help each other is really important. And you'll find you get like way further in your career if you can do that. Um, I, so I was like meeting with my boss yesterday and um, she told me that if there was one thing I had to tell you guys today, this is really embarrassing. She said it's the attitude that matters. Um, I don't know if you can tell, but I have a lot of energy. Um, and I'm like really cheesy, enthusiastic, but it's actually because I like legitimately love what I do and I really care. Um, and she said that I want, she wanted me to share that with you guys because a lot of times like your attitude and how you show up every single day is gonna get you way further than your skills. Like, don't get me wrong, your skills are incredibly important. But you can't like teach somebody to like care and be passionate and have enthusiasm and try to be a problem solver. Um, uh, so it's really important. Um, I think like an example of this is like last spring we had this request from our marketing team and they were like, hey guys, we really wanna do a brand new sleeping bag for Black Friday. And this was like Black Friday, just last Black Friday. And we were like, okay. Um, cool. So when do you need it? My first question is when do you need it in the warehouse? And um, what do you want it to be? What's the price point? Um, and then that all helps us um, build into the product. And at the time, we were actually down two team members. It was, I was the only developer. Ben was kind of the only designer. So Ben and I, I like worked with Ben and from the answers I got from our marketing team, um, built like a, a timeline. As you can tell, I love timelines. Um, from when they needed it to arrive in the warehouse to essentially like their target margin and all of this. And from there, we built this crazy timeline and worked with that factory I just showed you to build like a brand new sleeping bag. And we got two proto rounds of it, which is really cool. And we even sent it off to this university to get tested to see um, how cold it actually rated at. Um, so it was a huge win for us because I think that, um, I'm not good at math, but that was like way less time than it we take to do a lot of other things. And it's amazing the difference it, it, like when you actually work together and are working for like one common goal and you're like, I could have very well have told my marketing team, no, I'm alone right now. Um, but we were able to do this, which is super cool. Um, anyways. For lack of a better word, it's not necessarily about being a yes person, but it's more about being a can-do person um, because you don't necessarily need to say yes all the time because that just wouldn't be right and you'd probably be like really tired <laughs> and um, not taking care of yourself. But um, And the answer might not always be yes, but um, for example, like on any given day, I probably get like 10 to 15 different requests from various teams as well as working on all those deadlines I just told you and I could... I think like what matters is when people are asking you things like that, if something's possible, or can we change this, or hey, I know you just did like five proto rounds on that cooler bag, but um, we don't like it and we want to change it. Um, 
instead of just having like a reaction right away, really like just like taking that moment to pause and think about how do I want to move forward with this and what are the different like areas or like ways that we could do this. Um, so just being like super solution based. Um, and if that's like one thing I could leave you guys with today, that would be it. This is Snow, me and Snow. And then on the <laughs> other side is Ben. He's gonna hate me for showing you guys this. <laughs> And um, it's actually our material mill. This is in Taiwan when we went to see them in September. And they took us to a hot springs. And um, yeah, so we have like really close relationships because they're just as much part of our team as like everybody that sits with us day to day. And um, they're the people that help us make the material that then ships to Snow's factory. So that is, that's all I have for you guys today. I have some samples, but I feel like I just talked forever. So I don't know if I have time to show you guys samples.